revolutionary thinking. What if I told you we could turn off that gene that caused that lump to grow, or tell our bodies to create more insulin? What if I told you this was entirely possible? What if I told you we could manually arrange the biological building blocks to life the way we see fit? To control the expression of genes, we must first understand what epigenetics is. It is changes in the phenotype without changes in the genotype. In short, our sequence of bases isn't changed, but the way they expressed is. Epigenomes can either boost or interfere with the transcription of specific genes. In layman's terms, this is where our DNA creates readable instructions to make proteins. You can think of your genome, the DNA, as the workers of the whole system, while the epigenome is the boss telling the workers how and when to operate. There are two main ways we can induce epigenetic changes. One, through methylation, acts like a switch, turning genes on and off. And the other is histone modification, acts like a knob, turning up or turning down expression. Methylation works with our nifty little friends, enzymes, or DNA tr methyltransferases. They have specific amino acid structures that chemically interact with the DNA's promoter sequences, where the gene starts and they do so by transporting a CH3 group onto the primer rings of adenine or cytosine. This creates what's informally known as the fifth base, and by changing the base's chemical composition, transcriptional factors cannot bind to the DNA, inhibiting transcription. Therefore, RNA, the readable instructions, isn't made and switches off the gene. What about the knob function? Histones are proteins that DNA winds itself around. The tighter they are wound, the less the gene is expressed, while the looser they are wound, the gene is expressed more. Now, I've brought a little visual aid to help explain this. I need you people to imagine that you are the transcriptional factors, like DNA polymerase. Well, this here is my chromatin, and the colored bit is the gene. If I wind it tighter, you can't really see the gene, but if I wind it looser, you can. This works the same way with opening or closing off DNA to transcriptional factors. We can induce this histone modification through a process of acetylation. This is where we add or remove acetyl groups from the histone, causing the chemical electrostatic attractions to tighten or loosen, causing the unwinding or unwinding processes. And this is mediated through enzymes. Histone acetyltransferase or HAT, acts to boost the transcription of genes or the unwinding of DNA from the histone. It does so by adding an acetyl group to the histone, weakening its positive charge, therefore less force of attraction and the chromatin loosens. On the other hand, we can use histone deacetylase to remove the acetyl group, therefore the histone gets a more positive charge, stronger force of attraction and the chromatin tightens, therefore inhibiting transcription. So, how can we deliver this epigenetic therapy? Well, here I have you, CRISPR, the revolutionary tool of our genetic age. CRISPR uses a uh, single guide RNA as the driver, while an endonuclease DCAS9 as a car to deliver transcriptional factors. Now, it's important to note we're using DCAS9, which is a deactivated form of the endonuclease that does not make incisions along the DNA, because that's not what we want. The beauty of CRISPR is that we can attach any enzyme we want to mediate acetylation or methylation. The applications of epigenetics is a world of possibilities, whether we've got an overaccumulation or deficiency of something. We can apply it to HIV, Huntington's, even in cancers. We can boost the expression of tumor suppressor genes while inhibiting the expression of oncogenes. Therapies like radiotherapy or chemotherapy are dangerous to our cells. With epigenetic therapy, we could still deconstruct these unhealthy cells while leaving our implications and side effects out of the crossfire, even in the cases of faulty genes. Cancer is typically where there's a mutation in the 
protein stop codons, causing them to rapidly divide and invade other tissues, which is causing a number of functionary issues. With epigenetics, however, we could simply switch this gene off. Commonly known oncogenes is RAS and MYC. Using CRISPR, we could target the RAS gene and methylate it so it's no longer expressed. And the beauty of this is that epigenetic tags can be passed on through cellular division, so the gene will not be expressed again. Current conventional methods like radiotherapy or chemotherapy can destroy cancerous cells, but they do so in a way that induces necrosis, which swells up the cell and makes it burst its contents into the local area, which damages nearby healthy cells and causes inflammation. With epigene therapy, we can induce a more natural way of cellular decomposition, apoptosis, which is where we fragment the cells down and recycle this material to repair and new, make new healthy cells. There is a complicated pathway in the actions of apoptosis, but the main gene to mediate this is p53, which is usually damaged in most cancerous cells. We can still induce this to happen with apoptosis through an activated protein that kicks our caspases into action. These are little Pac-Mans that decompose the cell cytoskeleton. And these can be used through apoptotic protease activating factor 1 proteins, or APF1 for short. And they catalyze these activation of initiator caspases. The SED4 gene is responsible for making these proteins. So, with CRISPR, we can target this gene to histone and acetylate this histone so that we get more of these proteins created, essentially bypassing the faulty P53's gene and still making apoptosis happen. So what about viruses? It's a huge issue that our genetic treatments are trying to face today. Currently, we have superbugs that are resistant to our antibiotics. We're always trying to deal with these problems from the outside, but what about from the inside? We could use this idea of induced apoptosis to target our viruses, leaving our healthy human cells out of the crossfire. So what about the environment? Epigenomes can do wonders for our environment, both economically and sustainably. New Zealand's wealth currently relies heavily on our agriculture and tourism, but climate change and our conventional farming is posing a huge risk to our 100% pure environment and therefore our economy. We can multiply tenfold the produce of just one plant through boosting the transcription of edible proteins. Would you rather take care of five plants producing the same output as ten? In doing so, we're also reducing our waste and pollution, halving the landmass maintenance cost and total expenditure versus the profits, improving our environment and our economy. Other methods, like adding more genes in versus just boosting them, like other GMOs have done, causes major uh, issues in the plant's metabolic pathways. Take the Golden Rice Project. They inserted daffodil genes for more vitamin A, and while they did achieve this, it redirected the plant's resources for growth and development, causing major photosynthetic deficiencies. By boosting the gene's expression more, however, we are not redirecting these resources, just using the plant's own genes to make more. So this brings us to the implications versus the benefits. While the concept can do wonders, the execution is very hard to get right. Now, the benefits, they stem from how targeted it is. We can now, with pinpoint accuracy, attend to medical problems with minimal side effects, as CRISPR can lock into the exact gene where the problem is stemming from. Furthermore, epigenomes are heritable, so while we're improving our health and our plant's health, these traits are carried on to their future generations and their future's future generations. We are saving millions of health costs in the future by doing so. Lastly, as CRISPR's endonucleases are degradable by our body, we are making no biological waste. This is fantastic. And in the environment, we are reducing waste like nitrogen fertilizers polluting our waterways while still benefiting from the same produce, if not more. Other biological uh, benefits versus other genetic therapies is that it can work around issues that other gene therapies cannot. 
Class 4 CRISPR, making cuts in the DNA, has issues around toxicity to cells and making unintended decisions that are permanent. Furthermore, epigenomes can work around non-coding RNAs, anti-trans transcripts and microRNAs, which are essentially transcriptional factors that slip through other genetic therapies. Now, the implications. They really stem from our limited knowledge in the area. We're so newly explored to epigenetics, and there's so much we have left to discover. Furthermore, if we had an accurately mapped genome, it would be like holding the manual to every biological implication, every single issue we could ever face. Unfortunately, while we've had great feats in doing so, there is still so much we have left to learn about it. Next is our issues with expense. For us, it could cost between $500,000 and $1.5 million for this kind of treatment. So while we can solve the biological issues, the commercial issues of getting this out onto the market is a huge threat to making this available for everyone. However, by improving our species gene pool immunity, we could save millions of costs in the future, provided that we can sustain it now. A next issue which is interesting to consider is the ethics of this. With our increased longevity due to our developing technologies, we can have severe, awesome repercussions on our health. But the ethics of this that we tend to overlook is that we, while we can live to 100 years old, what's the quality of life at this point in our lives? 58% of men and 70% of women uh, over the age of 85 are in care. So, if we're improving their health and we're saving lives, what is the quality of life in this? Lastly is the sustainability. The materials used to make this gene therapy are unsustainable as they're one-time use only due to the genes involved in it and the uh, repercussions of involving other people's DNA. Therefore, with our developing technologies, this isn't an impossible hurdle to overcome. We have the genetic blueprints to life, and now we have the tools to design them the way we see fit. Thank you. Come here. Questions from the judges? Um, yes, thank you, Katrina. This is genetic modification by a back door, right? Yes. <laughs> and essentially. You don't, you, you don't think that New Zealand, with its very strict rules against genetic modification, would whisk this out the door very quickly? I think the reason that this would be better is because we're not altering the genome, we're altering how it's expressed, so we're not... Um, it's like the designer babies. It's uh, ethical conflict, but since we're not playing God in a way, we're only uh, helping what can be improved by uh, expressing something more or less, so changing how proteins are made. Is, is there, however, a substantive difference between epigenetics and eugenics? The main difference is uh, that we're influencing if a protein is made or if it's not, not the type of protein that is... You're messing with the gene pool, essentially, right? Uh, not messing with the bases of the gene pool, but uh, messing with how they are expressed. Do you think you'll get that past the general public? Uh, this is very much an ethics um, <laughs> issue, and it's a huge issue that our innovations are facing. But I think with our growing uh, science and technology, people are having more and more of an open mind to these kind of things. And I think in the future, it's not an impossible hurdle to overcome. You're aware that, that CRISPR has been found to increase the risk of cancer in mice? Yes, that's due to the unintended cuts at um, uh, sites that are permanent, but with epigenetics, it's reversible, so um, if there was a problem to arise, we can reverse this problem compared to normal CRISPR. Thank you. Thank you.